Hi, everybody. I'm here with Richard Grounds. He's, um, are you founder, director of the UT Language Project? Is that okay? And, but he's going to tell you more about that. So we'd love to hear about your work with the UT Language Project. We work with our youth and our elders. We talk with them in the language and working together, we can move our languages forward. Wonderful. And you are United Methodist. You're part of the United Methodist Church. So you're part of that connection as well. And so it's it's really wonderful to be here at the permanent United Nations Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues and with Indigenous Peoples talking about the different uh, ways in which the Methodist Church can interact. And here we have you, you're embodying mm. language and the church and um, Indigenous Peoples and these issues. Mm. But um, I would be curious for folks to know what what you've been doing here this week, what's it, what it's been like for you and how you're interacting with the forum. Well, we've been pushing uh, since the very beginning of the permanent forum uh, now for uh, 15 years, uh, calling for an International Year of Indigenous Languages. We started out with support from uh, the United Methodist Church and uh, at that time, particularly the World Council of Churches, um, Bishop, uh, Methodist Bishop uh, Eugenio Poma mm. from uh, Bolivia was mm. the, the lead desk person uh, for the Indigenous Peoples Program at the World Council of Churches. And we came every year and elevated this appeal to uh, have an international year. And we had, uh, we even had, uh, at uh, some point, I cycled on to the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches. Uh, we voiced the issue there. It became something that was uh, picked up and, you know, called for in, um, you know, uh, those days as well. Uh, and it's just been a long push. And uh, somehow, uh, not really from any direct um, leverage, you know, on our part, but just by coming and raising the issue, eventually somehow people uh, kind of realized that it would be a good thing to really help us uh, organize and come together and support indigenous language work in a global setting. So I work, you know, my first responsibility is in our local community with our elders, with our youth, but we are trying to elevate the issue of indigenous language um, challenges, revitalization, sex successes. The, the, you know, it's very clear, of course, if people don't even know the issues there, it's uh, not very likely that they will be able to help. So mm -hmm. we're, uh, mm -hmm. we've been promoting this idea of the International Year of Indigenous Languages for all these years, precisely as an organizing point to, to bring in uh, new players, new supporters, uh, elevate awareness. Uh, people do not understand that 90% uh, of the world's languages will be lost during the lifetime of my grandchildren mm. unless something is done about it. Literally, that's the that's the course we're on, and this is a this is a sea change. This is not a minor extinction. Uh, so this is this is what we're trying to call attention to and get people involved in and uh, to understand the value and importance of our indigenous languages. And what is the value and importance? I mean, um, we heard, I heard today in this, in this side group this morning, someone said that it was commented, well, indigenous languages are old fashioned and they're not needed anymore. We need to be able to, to communicate in what we've been calling the colonized languages. You know, in, in that case, it was Spanish. Why should folks like me that are non-indigenous care? Why? Is this important to us? Would you say? What would be your opinion on that? Well, there are uh, a number of arguments as to why our languages matter. Um, some of them that are very popular that I personally am not that that uh, big of a supporter of. The argument is that there's a utilitarian aspect, that there's a great deal of uh, embedded 
uh, knowledge within indigenous languages that is only known by elders in indigenous communities about animal species, about uh, specific landscapes, about how to live in a certain place. There, there is indeed enormous, you know, medicinal knowledge. Now, all of that is carried in the language. That's all true. And those are reasons to, to support and promote the survival of indigenous languages and indeed the flourishing of indigenous languages. But, you know, at the end of the day, it really sounds kind of like a utilitarian argument. If it's useful to the larger uh, colonial structure, <laughs> mm -hmm. then maybe we'll, we'll try to hold on to it. Um, our elders tell us that our languages are uh, a gift from the creator. Our languages are gifts that the Creator has given to each specific indigenous nation. So um, that's kind of our starting point in thinking about the value of our language. In other words, this is literally, as, as to the extent, I don't know exactly who our audience is here, but to the extent that this is a Methodist or Christian audience, um, literally I feel like uh, we're about the Lord's business. Uh, the Creator has put our languages here. It's up to us to be good stewards and to take care of the gifts that have been given to us. It is literally our responsibility as, as Christians to, to take care in the same way that we are to be stewards of the earth, of the diversity and rich uh, creation that has been put here. Uh, likewise, our languages are part of that. And indeed, you know, that is the vision of heaven, uh, you know, in... Uh, the great uh, revelation of what's going on in heaven is every nation, every tongue. Um, that's, that is heaven. That's the place where all of the, the gifts of language are present. And so uh, we feel like um, ultimately it's about respecting indigenous peoples and uh, their heritage and um, their cultures and not just making um, sure that things that are important or useful to the larger larger economies of you know patenting medicine or whatever else may be going on you know it's not just for those reasons that we should keep the languages it's really because uh, these are gifts from the creator and and we want to preserve and celebrate and cherish those things mm, yes so as United Methodists then, how could we uh, be allies or cooperate or um, advocate or, I mean, prayers are great. I've said that before with someone else in an interview, but I think yeah. probably there's some concrete things that we could do as United Methodists um, with you. Uh, do you have some ideas for us? Well, I, th I think there are so many ways to plug in and it depends to some extent on geographical location. Um, many areas in what's now the United States indigenous people have been pushed away and they've been removed from their traditional homelands. Um, and uh, if there's a congregation, um, you know, or a group that's not in an immediate area next to an indigenous community where they can provide support, they can provide church space. If they are, they can provide church space uh, for meetings. They can provide technical support. They can provide uh, help with funding to uh, defray the costs of having an immersion language program. Um, they can be involved in a, one of the projects we had uh, uh, started working on and has not come to com completion at this point, but you know, get, get all of the, the tribal language hymns uh, turned into teaching tools. Mm -hmm. you know, have a little curriculum where you, you know, people learn the hymns or maybe they already know the hymns, but they don't really know what the words are. They don't, they get a feeling or they know the general theme of the of the song uh, the tribal language hymn but uh, you know that's an opportunity for uh, you know creating a curriculum around that material so uh, that is to say even if you're not in an immediate area where indigenous communities are uh, you can still support it may be that you want to find out what people had been genocided in your area or what people had been uh, kicked out of your area. That may be a linkage point. There may be a certain sense of accountability that we're now on the land of these people that our government, that the Methodist Church participated very heavily in the process of benefiting from these 
uh, really ugly, ungodly removal processes. And, um, you know, there may be a sense of responsibility to try to uh, redress some of the consequences of these uh, physical genocidal assaults and then the subsequent uh, cultural genocide that was carried out for many generations. So uh, I think there's uh, many ways that people can plug in, including, as we say, of course, funding. Uh, providing physical space, you know, in-kind support. All of these things uh, really matter. Ultimately, I, I hate, uh, almost hate to say it, but, you know, our the survival of our indigenous languages hinges on growing new young speakers. That's mm -hmm. the critical piece. And in order to be successful at that, it really need, uh, you need real money. You need, it is an economic question. It is economics that forces young people to go away to school. They're not available to learn their language. Parents who could be uh, themselves uh, language learners don't have time to learn because they're stuck in a, in a job and have to do other things. If we had enough money to have at least a half-time position or a full-time position, then those could become uh, the learners that really master the language and become the language bearers to the next generation and help help teach the young ones coming up behind them. And but, you, you brought some of those people with you, I see. And when you presented the other day, it was interesting. I think I wanted to do one more follow-up question because we were talking about how even when students go to school, the hours of school are still only one-third of their day. And one-third of the day still isn't enough. Like these immersion programs yeah. you're, you're thinking and you're dreaming about are even more intense than that, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. So um, there are different strategies that can be deployed depending on the specific situation. But the bottom line is we've got to be very smart about using very limited resources, both uh, funding wise, but also the, the cultural capital, if we could put it in those terms, our elders, our speakers have very limited time. And we need to be really smart about how to make the most of that. Um, and how to capitalize on their knowledge, their wisdom, their willingness to share, and how do we uh, multiply their voice. So that's, uh, you know, there are many practical uh, routes that can be taken, but it will depend on kind of the specific local situation, and um, it will give us an opportunity to make the most of the, the gifts that the Creator is giving us in the present time. Yeah, because in the, in the case of the, the UT Language Project, I think you had another elder that passed just oh. this week, right? Oh, okay. So I'm very sorry to hear that. Very oh. sorry to hear that. Does that mean, are we down to three elders, two elders now? How many? Well, it means that uh, we're having to branch out to uh, work more with uh, people who grew up speaking Okay. and have a lot of traditional knowledge about ceremonies, about stories, but who may not be fully fluent in the language. So we, uh, they, they will have uh, skill sets and knowledge based on having grown up in the language, but their own language skills may not be, or they may have certain areas that they really can talk about in the language, but they may not be able to talk about everything, okay. you know. So this is a real loss and yes. it's happening right now. Yes. So any way that we can help and maybe oh. support. So thank you so much for talking to you. Oh, hante nei wei anzi o shi lei. Creator bless everyone. Hey, tala. Oh.